Uh-oh. <laughs> What's up, Brooklyn? I am thrilled to be back with you all today. Welcome back to the heart of the city that never sleeps. I'm your host, Jason Robinson, and this is Showtime, baby. Now, today in the show, we have the founder of Joey Jackson Law and CNN legal analyst, Joey Jackson. We will feature Joey on today's segment, Your Journey with J-Rob. This is where we find out people's personal journey to their success in life. So let's get ready for an hour of unfiltered talk where I always keep it real. While we have honest conversation, lots of debates, laughter, and a touch of that Brooklyn edge. So stay tuned, Showtimers, cause it's Showtime, baby, I'm out. <laughs> And welcome back to Showtime. I am so happy and privileged to be joined by the founder of Joey Jackson Law and CNN legal analyst, Mr. Joey Jackson. Welcome to the show, my man Joey. It is great to be with you, J-Rob, no question. A pleasure and a privilege. Man, it, it, it. I'm just so happy because I know you're Mr. Busy, so to get you here in the show, I'm ecstatic. <laughs> Listen, I understand that I'm never too busy for you. I appreciate all you do. I appreciate who you are, and I appreciate your mission and your vision. So it's great to be here, my good man. Thank you very much, Joey. And I'm so happy because you have done so much in your life, in your career. So I just want to take a little bit of, of your time today and... Go back a little bit, right? Where you started and where you are today and all in between. So we're gonna, we're gonna get at it. So I, I just want to start by asking you, um, so where were you born and, and raised? So I was born by the river. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can uh, sing too. <laughs> um, far from, uh, that'll be all that I'll sing. Okay, right? all right. But, um, so I uh, was born and raised in the Bronx, uh, Northeast Bronx, uh, around Eden Wall, um, and uh, had a, you know, it's was, it was the greatest of times. Great friends, great relationship, great family. Uh, I have a brother who's older. I have a sister who's older. So I was the youngest of three. Mm -hmm. uh, mom's, mom was a nurse uh, since retired. My dad, may he rest in peace. He was a police officer, and then he went to the fire department. Um, so, you know, nice middle class family living in a nice middle class neighborhood doing, uh, you know, the best we possibly could. But we had a great time in the boogie down. Man, I know mom is so proud of you because you're an attorney, your brother, a doctor, right? Yeah, he's uh, so my brother's in finance. He's a VP oh, he's for Chase. OK, he's a PhD. Yeah, PhD, he's a doctor. OK. I call him Dr. Jackson because he's a PhD. Yeah, that's what uh, I always saw. Everything. So, yeah, I saw yeah. <laughs> Cool. So. That's cool. That's cool. So yeah. how, how was it like growing up in, in the boogie down? Um, so, you know, it was it was really good. We uh, did a lot of great things together. Um, you know, as a family, we did a lot of great things. As a community, we did a lot of great things. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was really tight with my brother and sister. Uh, we, you know, we'd run up and down the block doing things that, you know, kids do, whether it's playing freeze tag, uh, <laughs> whether it's, you know, back in the day. Um, you Red know, light, Jay, green light, one, two, three. It was amazing. We, all of those nice things, <laughs> yeah. right, uh, that we used to play. And back in the day when you wanted to see if somebody wanted to hang out, you'd go ring their doorbell, right? There was not making a play date or texting or, you know, Instagramming or whatever nope. is done. You knock on their door and say, hey, you want to chill? And you would, right? So uh, we do a lot of that. Uh, a lot of athletics growing up. I played a lot of baseball. I was very fond of it. Uh, you know, we played a lot of football around the neighborhood. We did a, we did just a, a lot of really good things. The Bronx is a great place. It, uh, it's, I know it's got this reputation, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, it was just all good. Just a nice community of kids getting together. There was a lot of kids up and down the block. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just had fun 24 7. Right. It, was, it was the greatest of times. And that's great. Like, remember back in the days when we were kids, like you were saying, 
we was outside playing, right? You got on your bike, you're in your skateboard, you're doing yeah. all these different things. And I feel like a lot of us, that was like real fun, right? Now everyone is stuck inside. They're like you said, just stuck on Instagram, not really getting the exercise they need to get. It's like a whole, a whole different time, man. It, it kind of makes you miss it. <laughs> It, it, you know, it really does. I just, I just remember, you know, we'd go out, we'd, we'd walk to school. I went to St. Francis of Rome. You know, we were raised Catholic. Um, I'm more or less, you know, I'm more Christian now than I am Catholic, but we were raised Catholic. We used to walk to school, which was a 10 minute walk, uh, 15 at max. You know, when you're a kid, maybe, you know, you delay it because you're running around doing everything, but making a direct beeline to school. But I used to walk with my brother and sister there. I went from there from first to 10th grade. Mm -hmm. My mom used to walk with us occasionally and do that. Uh, and, you know, we'd come home after, after school. We'd hang out around the school, play around a little bit, come home. And it was just a nice family knit time, a uh, nice time to get together, to build relationships, to just bond with each other and, you know, to be the best we could be. Right. And like you said, you're... Your parents seemed like they were amazing. And all those things that you said when you were growing up, what was the most, um, the fun time you remember how your parents treated with you when you were growing up? You know, so they were, they were fantastic. And I have great memories. So I went, you know, first to eighth grade, I was in St. Francis of Rome. And then after I was at Iona Prep, which is a high school in mm -hmm. New Rochelle. Yeah. And I just remember growing up, uh, you know, both of them very positive people. I could remember... My mom would always be at my baseball games and everything wow. else. Uh, my dad, less so. Uh, you know, I played basketball also. And, you know, occasionally my dad would come. My mom would always be there. You could play but ball too, Joey? Is, wow. What's that? You could play basketball too. That was more in, that was more in elementary school okay, than a high school okay. thing. All okay. right? So, okay. you know, it's, it's, it, I wasn't that great, believe me. Okay. But <laughs> I, I always remember my dad when he used to come to my games. You know, I would pitch and I'd have a bad game. I'd walk the bases loaded and walk another and another. And after the game, he'd say, but your form is so good. You know, just, you know, you're going to keep working and you're going to start striking him out. And then yeah. talking of striking him out, I would then strike out. He'd be like, your swing is, I mean, you're right on point. <laughs> So he would just always motivate me. And it was right. interesting because years later, and I know we'll get there, but, you know, but when pivoting to being a lawyer, I'd speak to my dad after I was a prosecutor, I started and I, he'd ask me how my day went and I'd tell him and I'd say, oh, it wasn't that great, dad. And this and that. He said, are you kidding me? Do you know how fortunate it is for, you know, for people to have you in court for them and doing your thing? Do you know who you are? So he was always a very motivational builder. My mom was always supportive. My brother and sister always were. Yeah. It, was, it was a good childhood and one that I think, you know, had a lot to do with who I am now. And what would you say was the uh, most important lesson that your parents instilled in you as a young boy? So I, I got to say that, you know, the most important lesson is to keep going, right? Mm -hmm. The realities are, is that we're going to face a lot of adversities in life, right? We're going to get setbacks. We're going to be pushed around a little bit by life. Uh, not every day is a bowl of cherries, but if you wake up the next day, uh, you know, not forgetting the day before, because there's valuable lessons that happened the day before, yeah. but embracing what happened and using it as motivation for what you could do and could be. I think that that was really the lesson. Stay positive, stay focused, uh, look for the good things in people, uh, look for the bright side in tough situations, and keep working it through. And if you do that, you'll get to the other side. And I found that that's a life lesson that's been absolutely true, Jay. And that, and clearly from where you are today, you clearly, you know how some kids, they don't really listen to their parents. Like it goes in one ear and it's out the next, because that surely was my case. I ain't proud of that. But in your case, it went in this air and then go out the other. It just stuck there right in your brain. And that, that is, um, it's a testament to you and to your parents that they got through to you and it stuck. So kudos to them and kudos to you. <laughs> well, I, listen, I appreciate that because there's an awful lot that they did tell me that went in one, went out <laughs> the other, went in one, went out the other. But I think if, you know, as, as kids, and then you learn this later when I became a parent, I think if you, if you, you know, walk the walk and it's not only that you tell your kids to be positive, but they can see it in you. It's not only that you tell your kids to keep going, but they see it in you. 
It's not only that you say, hey, listen, you know what, shake it off and keep it pushing, but they see it in you. And I think I saw that in both of them, right, with my mom being a nurse and, yeah. you know, uh, going through whatever adversity she went through and my dad going through his adversities, yeah. just the way they handled themselves and the way that they, you know, comported themselves. It wasn't just talking to me. Right. It was, you know, living it, uh, you know, through me and with me. And I think that that was a, a very valuable thing that they did. Yeah. Yeah. And that that is so important. And what they instilled in you and your whole family you know, it just can't be appreciated enough from what um, our parents do for us. And you really made them proud. So kudos to you on that. And definitely also now you know, going from a young boy uh, going into college, I'm sure they made you understand how important that was to do that, which leads me to my next question. Um, wh what college or university uh, did you attend and why did you choose them? Also, where did you go for law school? Yeah, you know, so it's interesting because my story is, is a pretty interesting one. You know, I know so it is, I, of course. That's why you're here, my man. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you, Jay. Okay. You know, when I, was, when I was growing up, it wasn't like, you know, I was like, I want to be a lawyer. I have to be a lawyer. It was, I had, you know, I was a typical 17, 18 year old, not knowing what I wanted to do and just kind of figuring out life, not even knowing if I wanted to go to college or what mm -hmm. I wanted to do with my life. And it was pretty interesting because, you know, I just didn't excel in school and I just never really gave myself an opportunity. I was an average student. And I'll never forget, there was a, a um, teacher that I had in high school. He was an English teacher and he embarrassed me during the class. He asked me something and I sort of pretended not to know. And he's like, you know, it really annoys me when you have a, a, a young man with a relative degree of intelligence who acts like he doesn't know anything because apparently he... I guess he thinks it's cool. So that stuck with me. And then after class, he sat with me and he said, you know, you got some potential, use it, right? You're, you know, you're a bright kid, start studying, prepare yourself, get yourself together. And so that kind of went in one ear and went out the other. And I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> and then it was interesting because I didn't want to go to college. And my mom was like, are you kidding me? You're going to college. Oh like, yeah, no, they don't play. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I want to act on Broadway. I want to do this, whatever. <laughs> I want to take a year off. She's like, you're not taking a year off. So it was so funny. <laughs> there was a school, it was called SUNY Brockport, State University of New York at Brockport, which is up in Rochester and Buffalo. And what had happened was, what had happened was, what happened was, yeah. <laughs> they were having uh, an orientation. And so my mom booked the flight, did everything. And back then they had this airline, Jay, it was called People's Express. You literally paid on the plane. Really? And Wow. Yeah, you paid on the plane. Okay. You got on the plane and it was like a train. You you know, you give them the money then. And it was an hour trip, uh, a flight. Oh, like the Long Island Railroad. I think that's like you pay while you're on there, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. It, okay. was, it was incredible, right? Yeah. It was called People's Express. And so we get up to the school. We rent a car. Just my mom and I, we go. And, I, you know, of course, we, we after we rent the car, we go on campus. They put you up on campus. They have all these orientation programs. So that night I went out, I stayed out all night. I was into the frat life, the sorority life. I, you know, met all these people. We went into the local town in Rochester. We were partying. So I come back at night. And again, this was before uh, cell phones and yeah. pagers, any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. and I come back to the room and my mom's mortified. It's like 7.15 and we have to be out the door at eight o'clock. So what? I was trying to go to bed. She was like, what? <laughs> She's get up, like, boy. <laughs> you better get up. You better, you know, you better shower. You're not going to sleep. Right. So we we went to all the orientation programs. We sat in the very first row of every one of them. And literally my ribs were sore because she was keeping me awake by tagging my ribs. I'm like, <laughs> you know, but little did she know that I had such a good time the night before <laughs> that I was going to that school. Yeah, right, and, right. The funny thing about it, and most people don't know this, is that, you know, I had done so poorly in high school because I just didn't prepare um, that I had to get into what was called a transition program where you had to do a summer course for six weeks, take three courses. And if you got a B or better in each of the three courses, the school would admit you. So oh, as the yes, three yes. goes, I did that, went to the school, took the three courses, and I said to myself, I'm going to apply myself, I'm going to work hard, I'm going to study, I'm going to give myself an opportunity. And so lo and behold, I went, I did it, I got A's in the courses, 
and I was just vested. And so when I went to back to the school in September, right, for the semester, I said, I'm just going to really study hard. And so I kind of started finding myself. I met a mentor who happened to be an attorney uh, who I happened to speak to and meet with till this day. His name is Ian Mackler. And, you know, he just sort of looked out for me. And I started working and studying and doing the best I possibly could. And hence, I ended up doing pretty well in the school. I became student body president. I was on the honors roll. Wow. And it just sparked something in me to be like, hey, let's get this done. Yeah. And then you asked why I went to law school. I took a diversion first. I didn't go straight from college to law school. Okay. It was, it was interesting because when I was going to, in becoming student body president, I was so preoccupied with student government right. that I was 20 credits short four years later when it came time to graduate. Wow. And the interesting thing was... As a graduate or a person about to graduate who's the student body president, you have, you know, you give the address on behalf of the graduating class at the commencement. Oh, and I was 20 credits short and not graduating. So I go to this meeting with administrators and it was clear to me that they wanted me to give this presentation. Right. But that I was not qualified in the to the extent that I was not ready to graduate. So they concocted this plan to have me do it. <laughs> Okay. And the plan was that that summer I would do I would do a six credit program internship in Albany, okay. uh, which is, of course, the state capital of New York. Right. I was a political science major. And then I would go to Washington, D.C. in December, get 16 credits where I worked for Congressman Rangel. He used to represent right. Harlem. Mm -hmm. And I would get my diploma mailed to me in December. No one be, would be the wiser. And so I got to give the graduation speech. And so, it, you know, it was it was a pretty interesting thing. Wow, that is uh, an amazing story, by the way. <laughs> amazing story. And, and that's just a testament to how much they liked you, right? Because you didn't have the credits, but there was something that they saw in you that they said, we got to make sure that this guy graduates and makes this speech. Like, what do you think it's in you that they saw that they had to like move these mountains to make sure that that it's happened. Like, what do you think it is about you? You know, listen, I, you know, we all, um, I think every day have to have gratitude, right? Whether the day goes our way, the week goes our way, the year goes our way, uh, the morning, I just think we have to live with a lot of gratitude because a lot of things could have gone an entirely different way for each of us, yeah, right? Right. And so I try to live with that gratitude. Yeah. And, you know, when I was in school, you know, I did the best I could as a student. I think that, you know, I, I tried to represent the school as best I could. Uh, you know, I tried to in, inspire people and work with people and help people. And so I think that if they saw anything in me, it would be that I you know, had a lot of untapped potential. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I would have people spark me and work with me and have faith in me that maybe I could one day have faith in myself. Yeah. And I could make better things happen in my life. And so I would think that's what they saw to say, look, we have a person who has a unique opportunity that he'll remember for a lifetime. Yeah. What can we do to bottle up, you know, the energy, the enthusiasm in order that it carries him to the next stage. And so I think that's sort of what it was. And so I did the internship after the graduation, true to form. I got my six credits. I did the internship in Washington, D.C. I got my 16 credits. They mailed me their diploma as they noted they would. And no one was the wiser, right? Because I didn't have to go back to the campus. And then I worked for the mayor of New York City. At that time, it was David Dinkins. This mm -hmm. is a long time ago. Yes. Um, and actually, Dinkins was on the tail end. I actually worked for Mayor Koch for a year. Koch wow. was leaving, then Dinkins came in. Yeah. Um, and then I didn't go to law school right away because, again, after college, I was working for the mayor right. in New York City. And so I ended up going to Albany. I worked for the state legislature, and that's when I went to graduate school. So I have a master's in public administration, which I got in Albany right. because I wanted to do government, politics, something. Mm -hmm. And then once I got that, you know, it was interesting. I'll tell you a, a two-minute story. Mm -hmm. They had a tuition reimbursement program okay. where if you waited two years and you worked for the legislature, they would pay for your education. Awesome. And I said to myself, you know what? 
why don't I just start this program now? I don't want to wait two years. You know, I'm young, I'm motivated now. Mm -hmm. And so interestingly enough, two years later, right, I'd gotten my degree, okay. which was the master's, and they had canceled the tuition program by oh, then. Oh, no. So, you know, sometimes, right. you know, life has other plans for you. And it was at that point, Jay, where I said, okay, I got this master's, I'm involved in government. But I really like this legal thing. Let me try law. And so I graduated in actually uh, in August and I started law school that August also. And I went to um, Hofstra, which is on uh -huh. Long Island uh, yeah. right away. So that's that's that. And yeah, it's really interesting what you were saying. Your whole story is like I always follow the motto of if it's meant to be, it will be. And you can have your goals and and you should, you should always follow your goals, obviously. But sometimes God just leads you in the direction that where you are supposed to be, even if you didn't know that yourself. And he will take you there. And that's really, really amazing. I think it's sometimes your script is already written. And sometimes you just don't know it, right? You know, you do have a lot in your life how you can make things happen for yourself. But a lot of times the script is already written for you. So... I, you know what? I completely agree. I think that, you know, God leads us in different directions. I think we have to trust him when he does that. You know, we know he's never wrong. And that's why I just think that, you know, have a plan, have a mission. Sometimes that mission may shake up a little bit, not be exactly as you wanted it to be, but right. you'll get to the other side if you just continue to work through every single day. And mm -hmm. that's exactly what happened, you know, and that's, I started law school and uh, you know, then I was off to the races and just to, you know, button up uh, college and grad school before we get into the law school discussion. Right. One of the things about which I'm most proud is that, you know, it was probably about, I don't know, four years ago, just was right around right around COVID. Uh, the school, my college had asked me if, you know, if I'd be interested in having a center named after me, which would be the Joey Jackson Diversity Center. Oh, nice. And um, what an it, honor. Was, wow. it was it, it was an honor. And, you know, what was the most honorable about it to me it was that, you know, I think it was important to me, Jay, because that's who I was. I yeah. think I was a student when I was there who would, you know, get involved with, you know, my people as a person of color. Yeah. Uh, but also get involved in every other aspect. I didn't care whether you were Jewish, Italian, you know, Hispanic, you know, uh, Muslim, didn't matter. You know, I, I would try to reach out and bridge gaps. And it was interesting that years later, uh, I mean, I had stayed obviously in touch with the school. They had asked me to come speak a few times. I spoke at commencement and everything else. Mm -hmm. But it was sort of who I am. And so the the proudness in that is not so much, oh, I have a center named after me, whip it a D. Right. But it's the fact that it's the diversity center. And I think it embodies, you know, who I am. And then my grad school uh, had me back a couple of years ago, uh, you know, for an award there, too. So, mm. um, you know, I say that not to, again, be like, you know, oh, look at me, no. pat on the back. Yeah, right. But I just think that, you know, where you go, I think we're on a mission. And I think one of our missions is we get better ourselves is to try to make other people better around us. And I think one of the things that that says to me is that, you know, I some I somewhat contributed to that mission by not only elevating myself, but trying to to elevate, you know, the people I had the pleasure of meeting. So, yeah, that was yeah. I mean, and like I said, just having it named after you, it's a, it's amazing. It's, it's an honor, I'm sure, for you. And it just makes you feel uh, proud inside. But I am I am curious that to ask you if you were not a lawyer, what do you think that you would be doing with your life? You know, that's, that's the greatest question. <laughs> I, um, you have so many honestly, talents, right? You could probably do whatever you want. I'm just curious. <laughs> like, listen, I wish I had all these talents. You know, I, um, my talents are very limited, and they're limited to, wow, to what I really do. I mean, I couldn't even envision or imagine, uh, you know, what else I possibly would do if I didn't have the life of being a lawyer. And I, I guess I say that because my profession sort of embodies all the things I'm interested in. I'm interested in, uh, you know, uh, other people. I'm interested in affecting other people's lives. I'm interested in making people's lives better. I'm interested in strategic planning. I'm interested in 
strategy. I'm interested in having conversations. I'm interested in providing advice. I'm interested in mm. getting up in front of audiences like a jury and making a presentation. I'm, you know, so it kind of is a profession that, you know, really allows me to to reach my full potential and be all that I possibly can be. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I would say an athlete, if I had the talent, uh, what kind of athlete, what kind talent. Uh, listen, I, I, you know, I wouldn't, I would never have minded playing for the Yankees, you know? Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I see you at those Yankee games with Justin. So I see yes. you there. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. So I go, I go, you know, to the games, but I just didn't have the talent to do that. Okay. And, you know, this is what the talent that God blessed me to do. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I think, I think he got it right. He did. He definitely did. So uh, with that being said, at what point did you know that becoming an attorney was your calling and why? So I think, you know, when I, uh, in college, I started to figure it out. And it was interesting because my college roommate, I remember when we were 17, we were speaking and I say 17 because I turned 18. I turned it. I turned 18 that September. We're, uh, September. we're Virgo. We're Virgo babies. Yes. yes. We're you know? Virgo babies. Yes. We're brothers. Yeah, right? You're Virgo brothers. There you go. <laughs> yes. So that's why I say 17 because I turned 18 when I right. went. And yeah, I me remember too. Same him. thing. Yeah. Yeah, I remember him speaking with me and I remember him saying to me, hey, I want to be a judge one day. And, you know, we were both interested in law. We ran the student legal information service. And I remember getting a call from the judicial committee for him. Uh, geez, it was probably about 10 years ago now. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I literally started to cry because I, it brought mm-hmm. me back to when we were 17 year olds when he told me that. And I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, my God, it's here. Right. And he tried so long and hard to get there. And there he goes. And so I would say that I became interested in law in college and thought that maybe that's the path I should take. I interned for the lawyer who was a mentor. Um, and then I kind of diverted and said, maybe I'm interested in government. Let me yeah. figure it out. But I think that's where the spark was. And then okay. when I got my when I was taking graduate courses, I said, you know what, I'm going to do this legal thing. Yeah. And so that's why, you know, I started applying. I went to Hofstra and it was a phenomenal experience. And I also uh, gave the graduation address at, you know, I was the graduation speaker for my class at, at Hofstra Law School. Okay. And um, I'm proud about that. And I'm also proud that two years ago I was inducted into the Hofstra uh, Law Hall of Fame. So oh. I'm, I'm pr- Congratulations. Congratulations to you. Thank you. Well, Hofstra is very, very lucky to have you. And um, I know you love them a lot and they love you and they're looking at everything you're doing. And they're so proud of you, man, as we all are. So that's a good thing. (laughs) I'm I'm grateful for that. But, you know, I mean, again, Jay, it's just about, you know, going somewhere and just trying to make a difference. And the, the big thing about that is, you know, it, it shows it. you, you kind of went somewhere, you worked hard, you overcame the obstacles you needed to, you look back, you know, and I think in this life, we don't get to other levels by being selfish and making yeah. it all about us. We right. get to other levels because there's so many that help you get there. Right. Uh, and so many that you have to rely upon in order to be there. So if anything, you know, the awards with any of the schools that I went to establishes that, you know, I built relationships, those relationships were strong, um, and that, you know, I was unselfish in building them because, you know, it, it seems to me an indication that if it was, you know, me, 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 it wouldn't uh, have voted well for being recognized uh, in the way that, you know, the schools have, have been kind enough to recognize me. So, it's a it's a big important thing for me to uplift others as as I go and try to uplift myself. Well, you have always uplift, uplifted so many people along with myself. You've given me so much good advice over the years. You are definitely one of my mentors and just watching you and your career unfold and how successful you are has always been an inspiration to me. You know, so you know I'm always calling you and bugging you. Oh, Joey, let me get some advice for like that. So it's just a testament to you and how much people like myself respect everything that you do. Well, I'm grateful for that, Jay. And you know that uh, just as you're there, you know, for me and have been there, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm here for you. Uh, you know, we have a, an interesting history, uh, which was founded upon television. Yes. And 
was a great thing. Who knew those years ago when I was actually, you know, doing Fox News? Yeah. Uh, you know, just as a person who they were kind enough to ask to come through, that you would have the position, you'd be there, that you'd be so gracious in uh, calling me and asking me to do TV and yeah. asking to be on programs. And, you know, that's, that's a big springboard to where I am, having people like you who were bookers, yeah. right, saying, hey, let's Absolutely. get him involved. Yes. And that's what I mean, you know, so it's important. Oh, yeah, you were so, so nice. They were just showing a picture of you and I when I asked you to come down to my church and give a speech, and you came down to the church, and you was like, you know what? Actually, you should have been a preacher. Yeah, there we go right there. You should have been a preacher if you weren't an attorney because you came to my church and you put it down. I think my reverend got a little scared. He's like, oh, man, I might be out of a job. And you know what? He actually retired. So <laughs> it's true, true story. He actually retired now. So he's like, Joey's going to take my job. <laughs> you know, that was a great experience, and I was grateful for the opportunity to come and to, you know, speak to uh, all the, the parishioners on that beautiful day, that beautiful mm -hmm. Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and again, it's always nice to share a word of encouragement. Mm -hmm. And I think when we share words of encouragement and we try to inspire, it inspires us, right? So mm -hmm. I was grateful to have the opportunity to be there and to meet so many people. The energy was electric. And I think it, you know, re really made me a, a better person as I do it. So who knows? Maybe we'll get into the pulpit one day. Right, exactly. Exactly. So you were such a great student, obviously. Well, you say you were not a great student, which all of us went through our hard times. But I was always curious because I think you're, well, not I think, I know you're a brilliant man. In your opinion, what was the hardest test? Was it the bar, passing the bar, or is it the Series 7 test? You may not know about the Series 7 test, but... In your opinion, what's the hardest test, the bar or the Series 7 test? You know, it's interesting, Jay, because I became a good student, I think, in college. Okay. And the reason I became a good student in college is because, again, I gave myself an opportunity. I said, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to study. I'm going to just, you know, we all uh, are blessed by the Father from above to have whatever talent he's allowed us to have. Some people are great scientists, mathematicians you know, whatever it is, CPAs, accountants, athletes, doctors, whatever it is, God gives you, and we need to multiply those talents. And that's when I started giving myself the opportunity. So I became very good as a student uh, when I was in college, and then certainly in, you know, in grad school. And so ultimately, uh, and then in law school too. Okay. But I think the Series 7 test, from what I understand, is a, a pretty difficult exam, to I be hear. sure. Yeah. And I so, hear. you know, listen, I will take nothing away from that. The mm -hmm. bar exam, to me, I, I, you know, I know people will, will, will knock me. Um, you know, I, I had a lot of fun taking the bar exam. Okay, uh, fun? Okay. Yeah, I did. <laughs> okay. You know, okay. I, I really did. I had a, a measure of fun taking the bar exam. And I think it was because I just was prepared. I was locked in. It was something that I enjoyed and, and loved and appreciated. And that was really the only standardized test. I've taken them all. I've taken the GRE and the mm -hmm. LSAT and the right. GMAT. <laughs> and the only exam that I really excelled on was the bar. Thank goodness. Oh, well, I got yeah, it. Exactly. That's going to be the one test. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. <laughs> yeah. So, well, thank I God think, for that. <laughs> yeah, there's so many exams that are hard, and they're hard for diff, you know, for different people. So, you know, but okay. I think the bar exam was, uh, you know, I, I was cut out to take it. I took it, and and thank God it it worked out very well. So, so, yeah. What's the most rewarding part about being an attorney for you? I think the re most most rewarding part is the the impact that you have and the dynamic that you have on people's lives. I think lawyers change lives and you could change them for the better. Yeah. I think the stakes, Jay, are just so high uh, as far as, you know, there's when you're representing someone, whether that be you're saving their job, whether you're getting them back to work because they were unjustly suspended, uh, you know, whether it is that there's a criminal case and they're facing their life in jail and you're able to walk them out the room with you know, not even a scratch. Yeah. Uh, doesn't always happen, of course. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you have an opportunity to do that every day, to alter someone's life, to affect and change someone's life is just, it's just a, a great feeling, yeah. particularly when you're successful. 
And I, and I always tell people it's not even, you know, when you go to court, it's, it's the preparation that you do before you get to court that allows you when you're in court to excel. And I, I just don't think that's unlike any other thing, right? Yeah. You, you know, I mentioned athletics before. You can't tell me that these world-class athletes are not preparing and preparing and preparing. So whether they take the field or the court or right. whatever it is, it just flows because they're practiced. And yeah. I think that's what you have to do in law. Be prepared, be ready, and you really can alter the outcome in a very favorable way for someone. And that's got to be the great thing about what I do. Yeah, you help so many people in their lives, and they owe you literally their life. <laughs> you know, getting them off, a lot of the innocent people, you know, would not be here walking the streets if it wasn't for you. So I know they really... Uh, uh, value and love what you're able to do for them. So I can see why that's, you know, uh, you know, very important for you, obviously. Um, you know, I, I did want to find out how proud are you of you for starting your own law firm, uh, Joey Jackson Law, and what was your motivation behind doing that? So, you know, uh, I have to tell you that um, I thought about it for a long time, starting my own practice, and it was not without you know, trials and error and trepidation and everything else. Uh, you know, my wife would tell me, uh, by the way, it's 28 years this December, a long time. Mm -hmm. um, she would always say, listen, start your own practice. I don't care if we have to eat tuna fish. Start your own practice. Do Katya it. Katya wanted to. tuna fish? No. Yeah, she was like, she was listen, <laughs> okay. she was like, I'll do whatever it takes, uh -oh. but I think you really need to think about that. Uh, you know, and I was with another practice and I was having a good time there. And I said, you know what, let me uh, let me give this a shot. And yeah. so I did. And it was interesting because I had um, connected with a person who was a union leader and they made all type of commitments that they were going to do this and that and the other for me. And so I left my job. Fortunately, I had CNN. We could talk about how that came yep. about mm -hmm. later. We'll but, that. Um, you know, I went out on my own with the understanding that I would have all this business and then this person who promised me all of this, and it wasn't that long ago, it was in 2019, uh, January, 2019, all of a sudden he was like, ah, uh, never mind. Oh, um, wow. So that was a pretty interesting thing, mm. uh, to go from, uh, in fact, it was 2018. Yeah. Okay. To go from, you know, Hey, I'm going to give you this business to never mind. Yeah. But then, it, right. And then I just said, look, you know, I talked about just coming full circle, how you have to hunker down. Yeah. And you just have to stay positive, stay focused and be the best you can be today and not worry about what happened yesterday or last week and just keep it pushing. And I did that. And one client became two and two became three and three became four. And then eventually, two years later, I was able to secure, you know, union business and, you know, yeah. hire uh, you know, five other lawyers and paralegals and everything mm -hmm. else. So, you know, God is good, you know, um, right. but it would have not happened if I had not said, let me do this. And mm -hmm. I think a guiding sort of push to that was not only that, you know, I have a vision of what a law firm should be. I have a vision of yeah. delivering services and what representation should look like. But I wanted to build a legacy also for my son who you know, I didn't push to go into law. He was interested in a lot of different things, but mm -hmm. he interned with me a long time and he naturally went into it. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to build a legacy that we could have something for the, you know, for the family, for us, for, you know, something that was b bigger than us. And so I wanted to build a business. And so here we are uh, in Manhattan, uh, Five Penn Plaza, doing the best we can, yeah. uh, helping an awful lot of people uh, with a with a great practice. And so... I'm really happy about that, but I think mm -hmm. you know, my family was a ma very big motivating factor behind making this happen. So here I am. Yeah, and sometimes you were talking about uh, in your life, sometimes a setback is just sending you back just for a comeback, right? And that sounds right. like that's what happened for you. You had that little setback, but you used that as a motivation for you, and then boom. It's like, you know, I'm going to start my own thing by myself, and it just makes you work harder. It makes you more hungrier, um, and you were determined to do it, and boom, there you go. So I'm proud of you doing that, man. 
I appreciate you, Jay. Yeah, it was uh, it was an interesting thing, and it was you know it was a lot of it's a lot of fear uh, because you know you're doing your own thing. You don't know, hey, if I leave, are clients going to come with me? You're not right. getting a regular paycheck. You know, you're building your own type of situation, and you know we went from that to you know uh, building a you know building a pretty solid and diverse firm and. You know, um, making sure that now I'm the employer who has to make sure that everybody gets paid every two weeks. Right, (laughs) right, right. That that wouldn't have happened unless we had, you know, a little bit of courage, a little bit of, uh, you know, push, a lot of push. Right. uh, But the incentive to say, hey, it's enough. I could do this and we're we're doing it. So I'm just working as hard as I can and trying to see if God continues to be gracious enough to, to bless me as much as he has. And, mm-hmm. you know, well, well, we'll see how it goes. Well, God is good and he definitely will continue to bless you. Um, tell me about some of the uh, mentors in your career and, and kind of life in general. Who are some of your mentors? Yeah, you know what? So uh, obviously I mentioned the, the mentor that I had. Uh, okay, right. Yeah. At, at school when I was in college, I had a great mentor who pushed me into law and it was just, he was a person who a high character person, a person who liked other people, a person who taught me how to be diplomatic, a person who taught me, you know, how to, uh, you know, always have a sense of humility and being humble and doing the best you can. So he was, was always, and still is a tremendous mentor. Uh, you know, my father in his positive attitude of who he is and what he's about has been a great mentor. My brother, uh, you know, has been a, a great mentor. Uh, you know, I look at people like Johnny Cochran, may he rest in peace yes. and what he's done for the legal profession. I uh, had occasion to meet him a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, you, we all have kind of people we look up to. And, right. uh, you know, it's it's been a been a great experience so far. Well, it really is always important to have mentors, and um, they really help you get to the next step in your career. And it's yeah. so great to see that they helped you to get where you um, are right now and are today. So that that's amazing. So I I, I al- always want to ask you this question though. And you don't have to answer it if you don't want to. But this is what I wanted to know with this question. So. Um, However, um, I know, so being a defense attorney, right, I know you come across a lot of innocent potential clients, right, and mm-hmm. a lot of guilty potential clients, right, in, in your opinion. Now, it, yeah. is it difficult making the decision to take on a client that you feel deep down in your soul probably guilty of the crime, whether they may be maybe killed someone or involved in like in a Ponzi scheme or an assault or a crime of any nature. Is that ever difficult for you, like deciding to take on any of those kinds of clients or is it just a part of the job? So here's the answer. Okay. Uh, the, the answer is, it's a twofold answer. Okay. The first, and I'll answer okay. the first part with a story. Okay. Um, well, I'll answer the second part with the story. The okay. first part is, look, you never really know uh, and who's true. guilty, who isn't guilty, unless you really pull back the onion and make a determination as to what's what and who's who and where's where. So you never really know. And mm-hmm. everyone, number two, deserves that measure of the benefit of the doubt. They deserve that measure of your care, your attention, uh, and the best of who you are. And, you know, then the, the other aspect of it is that, you know, we have an obligation as attorneys to hold the prosecutor, if it's a criminal case, to their burden of proof. Mm-hmm. And so let's say in a DWI case, I'm not going up to the jury and I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen, my client never had a drink in his life. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, right, you can't, he, right. He's a choir boy and, <laughs> you know, was never drunk. Mm-hmm. But I am, you know, but what I'm doing is I'm raising doubt, right? I'm, I'm speaking to the officer on the stand. Sir, you indicate that you smelled alcohol in my client's breath. Is that right? But it's fair to say that you can smell alcohol in someone's breath and they not be intoxicated. Mm-hmm. Is that, that accurate, right? Yeah. Now, you mentioned that my client had slurred speech. It's fair to say that you don't know how they speak under the normal circumstances. Would that be accurate? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's also fair to say that you mentioned, you know, that, uh, for example, they were 
uh, unsteady on their feet, right? Do you know if the, the pavement uh, was disjointed in any way? Do you know if it was an unflat surface or something else? So what am I saying? Those are poor examples, but they're examples of what you're doing is you're not saying your client is innocent. You're holding the people to their burden of proof. My client had glassy eyes, okay? Now, people can have allergies and have glassy eyes. People can be tired. People can have something in their eye. So I always look at it as I'm doing my job yeah. to hold the government to their burden to establish that a person is guilty. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'll answer, and this is a lesson that I learned probably about 12 years ago, and I'll be brief in this, but mm -hmm. I remember someone came to me and they were uh, charged with attempted murder and they were out on some ungodly amount of bail. Mm -hmm. And what happened was, is there were four eyewitnesses that said he did it. And there was DNA on the knife that was recovered from his pocket. Mm -hmm. And I said, sir, I'll get the best plea deal I can for you, but I don't know what else you want me to do. And he, <laughs> yeah, I, right. I, right. A, a, you want to see a grown man cry? This was a grown man crying. <laughs> and he was like, I didn't do this, Mr. Jackson. I'm yeah. telling you I didn't. I said, but there's four eyewitnesses who said you did. And they tested the knife in your pocket and it had the DNA of the victim. Like, what do you want me to do? And he had just bought a home and he had a beautiful daughter and a beautiful family. So I said, let me take a look. So I look at the case and what happens is the four witnesses that I see I noticed that all of them are known to each other. And why is that important? There was This nightclub must have had 300 people there. So why is it that all four witnesses are known to each other? Couldn't there have been a passerby, a waiter, a bartender, a security person, uh, an uninterested? Why, why do That didn't make sense to me. Mm. And then the other thing that I realized is when I looked at the DNA, there were 12 officers who came to the scene for the stabbing. The one who handled the knife was the same officer who assisted the bloody victim mm. onto the stretcher and onto the ambulance. Yeah, yeah. But wait a second. Mm -hmm. So I said, we have an issue. So we go to trial and I, I you know, I interview the witnesses. One witness says, well, you know, I, I had been drinking, but he was in the general vicinity of where it happened. I said, so you didn't see it. You mm -hmm. just know that he was in the area. Well, yeah, that's true. So then I interview the next witness and he says, well, I was with the other guy who saw it and he told me he saw it. So I'm thinking it was him. Right. And the problem in this case was that the person who was alleged to have done it was an African-American man. Mm. He was short. He was bald. He was built with a purple shirt. Now, the reason I say that to mm -hmm. you is because it's a very unique description, yeah, right. which has to tell the client, look, all of them with this unique description say it was you. Mm -hmm. So the other person was the one who got stabbed. Now, mm. I got a gift. And the gift was the medical records. They ask you before he lost consciousness, they interviewed him and they said, hey, who did this? Medical records, I don't know. Somebody stabbed me from behind, no clue. On the witness stand, he's like, your guy did it. So I said, wait a minute. I'm looking at these medical records, and they ask you certain things. Yes. And you gave them answers. Yes. And you were truthful in doing that, of right. course. But you said you didn't know who did it. Well, mm -hmm. well, I didn't. So they fell apart. Oh. And then we get to the issue of the knife, and it goes to show that there are these 12 cops that arrive. And the very cop who Pat Friss, my guy, takes and examines a knife had just been dealing with a bloody victim. Oh, man, yeah. yeah. Ultimately, the guys acquitted. And so it taught me a valuable lesson, which is suppress your own judgments. Don't put your judgment in place of what a jury's judgment is. Do your job. Evaluate the case. Prepare as much as you can. Peel back the onion and get some justice for a person who thinks highly enough of you to ask you to hold their hand through this process. And that's how I answer your question. And that, and that's a beautiful answer. And that makes uh, complete sense because like you said earlier, it you just don't know. And in your job, it's really not about knowing, it's just about doing your job uh, to the best of your ability. And like you said, your clients are reaching out because they trust that you are the best one to do the job. So yeah, that makes complete sense. You never, you, you never know. So you do an amazing job. Um, whether they're innocent, whether they're guilty, you do the job and you get it done. <laughs> That's it. You know, we, we just have to do the best we possibly can, Jay. Irrespective yeah. of what our own judgments are, just keep evaluating the data, present the best possible case. And that's what you have a jury for. A jury right. will make the determination as to guilt or innocence, not me. Exactly. <laughs> that's your job. That's what you're saying. That's your job and not me. Exactly. exactly. So I'm curious about this too, Joey. I see all these judges on TV, right? Are, are they all like real judges or 
are they just TV judges? And do you need to be an attorney to be like a, a real judge? So the answer is, is that to be a judge that you see in a courtroom, mm -hmm. right, and, and not on TV, but actually when you go to a courtroom, if you ever get to a courtroom, um, you know, uh, that, that you have to have gone to law school, you have to have mm -hmm. practiced for at least 10 years, and then at some point subsequent to that, you become a judge. Mm -hmm. The ones on TV, and there's some brilliant judges, you don't necessarily have to have been a judge or, you know, have to have practiced law. They just like the personality and they do what they do. But, mm -hmm. you know, look, to each their own, there's some very, there's some great judges on TV. They do a phenomenal job. They've got a great uh, base and people who love to watch them. And, mm -hmm. you know, let's face it, TV is entertainment. And right. if you can entertain and producers put you on TV to do the job you do at weeding out the evidence and information, then you deserve the job. So yeah, that's, right. That's, that's <laughs> so have you ever thought about having your own judge show? Like Judge Joey, right? That has, that has a nice, nice ring to it, don't you think? I mean... So, you know, interestingly enough, Jay, my, um, I, I never even envisioned doing TV to begin with, quite frankly. Uh, mm. You know, it, TV for me was just a fluke. Uh, okay. So I, I'm sort of on, you know, everything that I do with TV is gravy. You know, you remember our friend Patricia Peard at I Fox. do. I do. So I, I put out this website years ago, and I get a phone call from Fox News saying, hey, we do research. We were looking at the internet, and you look like you can walk and chew gum at the same time. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm, like, I'm like, all right, uh, what do you need? And it was, <laughs> it was the OJ case where OJ tried to steal his own Heisman trophy, right? Oh, yeah, I remember. Remember that? He needed the money. <laughs> Right. right. So yeah. they're like, you know, OJ, he's stealing his own Heisman Trophy. And so I'm talking to Patricia. I'm like, but Patricia, I'm, I don't practice in Vegas. She's like, I get it. I don't know OJ. I get it. I'm not on OJ's team. I get it. <laughs> you know, she says, I, I don't, she was so patient. I literally get a, 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 little, a cold call from Fox News about right. television. And I'm talking myself off the ledge of going on TV. Right? <laughs> he was like, no, I don't want to do it. <laughs> He was so patient with me. Yeah. It was incredible. Anybody else I'm convinced would have hung up on me and said, this guy's <laughs> a nut job. What is he talking about? Right, right. But she was so patient. And so I started doing, you know, I, I said, okay, I'll come in. I'll try it. And one thing led to another, to another. And before you know it, you know, I'm knee deep into it. So the way, reason I'm answering that is, you know, it's been such a blessing even to be on TV much less to do a show, to have a show, or, or anything else. And so, you know, you never know what the future holds. Uh, you know, there are people who have been very gracious uh, throughout the years to ask to do things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, media is a tough business. I've been asked to do a number of things that was supposed to go left, and they went right, or was supposed to go center, and they went reverse. Um, but I'll just keep, you know, being the best of who I am, uh, speaking to great people like you, having the benefit to do great Zoom interviews with phenomenal interviewers like yourself. Thank you. Thank and you. The chips will fall where the, the chips may. So I don't, it's not something I think about, okay. uh, but you know, okay. um, I'm just grateful for every opportunity. So, well, let's see if you have what it takes anyway to be a judge. I'm very curious, right? So I want to play a little game of Judge Joey here, all right? Okay. Just to let oh. you see. Now, Here's my question, Judge Joey. Uh, I was seeing a woman once, right? Now, she was very nice and very pretty, right? Very nice woman. Now, she was a little overweight, you know? I would simply was just being honest with her one day by, by, you know, telling her that I was unable to, you know, continue to be with her, like, in that way because of that. So she condemned me, Judge Joey. And she charged me with the crime of leading her on. Now, Your Honor, all I was doing was following my moral compass that I followed my whole life. And that is basically, you know, honesty is the best policy. So, Judge Joey, am I guilty of the crime of leading her on? Or am I innocent because I followed my moral compass of honesty is the best policy. What say you, Judge Joey? 
Well, Judge Joey's a bit biased because, you know, I think the world of you and, uh, <laughs> you know, even if you were guilty, I would attempt to establish your innocence in any way I possibly can. OK, thank you. you know, thank you, sir. And so I would just say it this way. OK, you know, all of us have certain values, and I think that it's incumbent upon us to follow those values. And while a person may not necessarily have been for you, I think you owe it to yourself to acknowledge that. and to move on from that as you did, right? As opposed to staying in something where your heart isn't in it, right? I'm sure that there's another person uh, for her. Uh, I'm sure there are multiple other people. Right, that right. Right, it just was not you. Um, you know, I, and I just think it's the nature of how we tell things to people, right? Honesty, yes, it's the best policy. Uh, you know, we, we may not want to go overboard and what we're being honest about, particularly when it's so personal in terms of weight or something else. Uh, but I think that, you know, you had to make a decision about what would make you feel best about yourself, about you moving on and about this relationship right. and about you saying something to someone you cared about, but just not enough to be with her in that particular way. So I think you handled it in the way that your gut told you to. I think you handled it in the way that you felt was most appropriate at the time. And I think that if you feel in your heart of hearts that you did the right thing by letting everything out on the table, then I don't think that there's anything wrong with that at all. And so I could never adjudicate you of being guilty. Well, thank you very much. Judge Joey has spoken. Exactly. That's what I thought. I just needed to hear it from you. So thank you very much, my man. I appreciate you. Thank you for getting me Done. off. <laughs> Done. Done. Now, now, not only are you an accomplished and very successful attorney, you're also a rock star on TV as a legal analyst for various news outlets throughout the year. So tell us how you got into that and why you made the decision to lend your legal expertise to the uh, various TV news airwaves. Yeah, you know, Jay, so again, you know, I... I never was a person who wanted to be on TV or who thought that TV would be a career or that TV would, you know, that there'd ever be an opportunity to be on TV. But when I had that experience with Patricia Peart, when she called yeah. me out of the blue for the OJ Vegas case, you know, I started doing it then. Uh, and what happened was, is that TV is not a secret, right? When you're on TV, there's a lot of eyeballs, depending upon where you are, that see it. Mm -hmm. And I stayed true to my law practice, but I also decided that, hey, I'll, I'll do TV as well. One thing led to another. I did Fox News for basically for free for five years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and even that, I was having a good time. As you know, they send a nice car to pick you yeah, up and yeah, where you right. had to go. But I wasn't getting paid, but I was having a good enough time. I loved the people who I was working with. And there came a time where I was offered an opportunity with Court TV. I let Fox know that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they said, that's great. Good luck in Court TV. And mm -hmm. I said, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And Court TV led to headline news, which led to CNN. And um, here's where I am. And right. so it just was a confluence of circumstances, not something that I, you know, applied for, not something I'd ever thought I would do, but something that, you know, I, I guess it was just a destination that the, the the man above had for me. And so I arrived at the destination. And so this is what we do. And I, I enjoy it. And uh, so you are currently a CNN legal analyst. Um, how much fun are you having being a uh, CNN legal analyst? You're doing an amazing job. But how much fun is it for you? You know, thanks, Jay. I, it's it's a great time. You know, there are a world of issues out there in every regard. There are criminal cases aplenty that come up. You know, just today I was speaking about a case where a father is being held responsible on trial for what his son did in a mass shooting. Uh, you know, every day there's something that goes on, uh, you know. So yesterday I was talking about uh, the former president and E. Jean Carroll yeah. and the $90 million he owes. There's just a wealth of things that are happening on any given day. So it's just a matter of preparing yourself for the news of the day, being able to deliver it in a way that, you know, we all have our inclinations of, of right and wrong, et cetera. 
but I view my job as more expressing, you know, the positives and the negatives, the pros and the cons, and allowing the masses to kind of, you know, reach their own determination. And so mm. it, it's been great. I get to work with a lot of great people. Uh, you know, I've had the pleasure and privilege of, you know, furthering my relationship with you being yeah. on CNN. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, I love the anchors, uh, the the people who are the producers, the bookers, the executives. They've been very good to me over the years. And I've been, geez, I've been contracted to them. It's been been probably about oh goodness a dozen years now yeah so, right right yeah yep. mm-hmm. so my my contract started as a 90-day contract and then it went to a six-month contract and mm-hmm. then it went to a yearly contract and then you know now it's every two years so uh, right it's all good well i mean you you're very successful in your career and you have a great life at home and i'm just curious is there anything else that you would like to accomplish in your in your very career um, or in your personal life that you haven't so far? Because you, you've done everything, my man. So I'm just curious, is there anything else left there for you to do? Listen, there's a, there's a lot left to do. Okay, I mean, all right. <laughs> you know, first and foremost is that, you know, the accomplishment of being a, a, a better person, uh, being a person who... Uh, you know, embodies the the right the right values, the right views, the the right beliefs. That's you know that's important to me. No one's going to be perfect, but I want to try to continue to be a person of gratitude, a person who, uh, again, I don't see myself preaching in a you know in a pulpit. <laughs> you but, know what? <laughs> okay. You okay. never can tell. Okay. Um, you know, but that's important to me. I think you know. Um, I grew up as I told you a, as a Catholic. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm more a Christian now, mm-hmm. but it's important to me that I try every day to, to bless people and whatever way I could bless them. And so, you know, I, I try to do that by being the best disciple of the man above that I possibly can be. So I'll continue to try to do that. I'll continue to try to be the best person I can be for my family. I'll, I'll try to do that. The best father I can be, husband I can be. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, again, we, you know, we all want to aspire to be better. I want to aspire to be to have the best firm I possibly can have, to right. have the best people around me I possibly can have, uh, to be the best analyst on TV that I possibly can be. And so, you know, there's a lot, lot left undone in terms of, you know, taking everything that I do to another level. Mm-hmm. And let's see if I, you know, continue to work hard, do the right things and, uh, you know, uh, let if I share my blessings with others, uh, may- maybe I'll be continue, I should say, to be blessed as well. So we'll see. Well, I just want to say, you know, your family is so beautiful. I love your wife, Katya, such an amazing woman. Um, you're lucky man to get Katya. God bless you. And you are also lucky to have your son, Justin. And I just want to tell you congratulations to Justin. I know, like you said earlier, he's working with you now. He recently passed the bar. And, uh, you know, everything is going great for him. And it's so great to see that father and son is working together. It's so to see your whole family, all the love and the compassion there between all of you and everybody being so successful it just warms my heart. So, you know, that's great for you guys. I love that. Thank you, Jay. We're trying. You know, it takes a village. His, right. uh, it's, you know, he's, uh, his mom d- done a great job with him. And I'm yeah. so, so grateful that... Uh, you know, he passed the bar and he's here. He's doing a great job for us. It was it was so funny, just in 30 seconds or less. So we're on a plane going to Miami, we being Justin Koch and myself, and we're doing a mediation. I actually took him because I had an employment case that we were trying to settle uh, in Miami. And so we're we're on the plane going, and what happens is, is the bar results come out. Right. And so just then, he's like, the bar results are out. I'm going to look. And then, of course, Wi-Fi goes down for Ooh. an hour. Well, an hour. Yeah. So then Wi-Fi finally comes back an hour later. Poor kid is like squirming, stressing. Mm-hmm. He looks on. He's like, yes, I passed the bar. The whole plane claps. It was oh, a beautiful. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Pretty funny. Pretty that's funny. That's awesome. Well, it, in closing, if there was one message you would leave for any of our viewers who are watching, who are, you know, they're going through any hard times in their life or doubting themselves and reaching their goals in life, what would that message be to them? I think the message would be a fewfold. Mm -hmm. I think number one 
is something that you touched upon and I completely agree. And that is that we are never, ever, ever measured by the setback. We're measured by the comeback. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, we have to shake yesterday off and be the best person we can be today. And even in today, right, a, a bad morning doesn't make a bad afternoon, a bad evening, a bad afternoon doesn't make a bad evening, a bad evening doesn't make a bad night. And so I think we have to, the first message I would have is that, you know, whatever you may be going through, just, you know, do the best you possibly can to focus on what are you going to do now, right? What are you going to do from this point forward to advance yourself? Right. I think the second thing I would say is that, you know, uh, We've got to have, I think, positive thoughts, which lead to positive actions, yeah. right? The bottom line is that the body is the servant of the mind. And if we could serve our bodies by, you know, having the right thoughts, the proper thoughts, um, I think that that's really important because thoughts really inform our habits and our habits really inform our actions and the things that we do to bring us to that level of success. And then I guess the third thing that I would say is as difficult as it is, and I touched upon this when I was talking about my practice, yeah. I think that we have to sort of, you know, as much as fear and doubt are part of life, there's no question about it, I think that we have to try to avoid them as much as we possibly can. We have to try to displace fear and displace doubt in every possible way. Mm. And we have to just really get the fear and doubt out of our mind and have an attitude of gratitude and expectancy. And I think if we do the right things, we can speak things and do things into existence. And so that would be the message that I would give to anyone who, who heard this. Well, amen to that, Joey. Uh, that's a great message. And you don't know how many people, well, I'm sure you do, they need to hear that. And you know, a lot of us going through a lot of ups and downs in our lives, whether it's in you know, our career, our personal lives, our health, yeah. so many situations where you feel like you're down and you can't just get back to where you need to be mentally to, to see another day or to, to strive to be a better you than you were yesterday. So to hear a message like that and to see you um, live out your life and live out all your dreams in the manner that you are, it just makes everybody know that, hey, listen, if Joey can do it, and, I can do it too. So just keep yeah. going at it. So, so thank you for leaving us with that message. That, that was truly amazing. And, and thank you so much for doing that, Joey, for real. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, uh, you know, for all you do, for all you are, uh, for your beautiful family that I've had uh, the opportunity to meet. Your, uh, my mother loves you more than she loves me, Joey, by the way. <laughs> Never, never. Yeah, yeah, mom, uh, I, yes, yes. I love your mom back. She's an amazing, <laughs> amazing woman. Amazing woman. As a, as a your sisters, um, you know, your dad may he rest in peace. Yes. A, amazing family you have. And yes. you're doing great things and you'll continue to do great things. And um, I just want to be able to continue to brag on you and continue to say that I told you so. You so. did. You did. You named yeah. me, by the way, Joey. Remember, you named me J-Rob. That, that was your job. Wow. Wow. You, you forgot that, huh? <laughs> Funny. J-Rob in the house. In the yes, house. Sir. In the house. Well, thank you so much, Joey, for joining me. Um, it was amazing. We will be back with more Showtime after this. And make sure to come back and visit me again, Joey. Love you, man. All right, everyone. That's a wrap here on Showtime. I'm your host, Jason Robinson. And thanks again to Joey Jackson for joining us for your journey with J-Rob. You are a true inspiration to all. All right, everyone, we'll see you tomorrow for more talk with Joey Jackson, more fun, laughs, and good times. And after this, stay tuned for new episodes of Genesis. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day, and keep spreading love that Brooklyn way. <laughs>